following the NRA money after another mass shooting. Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Laura Bischoff, State House reporter for the Dayton Daily News, Andy Chow, State House reporter for Ohio Public Radio, Shannon Jones, former state legislator, and Joseph Moss of the Ohio Hispanic Coalition. For the eighth time since January 1st, someone in a school was killed or hurt by a gun. The eighth serious school shooting in seven weeks killed 17 students at a high school in South Florida. Police say 19-year-old Nicholas Cruz pulled a fire alarm to get students and teachers into the hallways and then gunned them down with an AR-15 semi-automatic assault rifle. Amid the thoughts and prayers came calls for greater gun control and more mental health treatment. Ohio lawmakers used Twitter to comment. Rob Portman called it heartbreaking news, saying he and his wife Jane send their prayers to the school community and victims of the tragedy. Sherrod Brown's message was similar, saying he and his wife Connie are heartbroken for all those affected by yet another senseless act of violence. He also thanked first responders and medical professionals. But for many, those thoughts aren't enough. We can say all these great things like we condolences and saying we're so sorry for your loss is obviously important. But what we need at this point is not to say that anymore because there shouldn't be any more children that die. We need to take action. Shannon Jones, will this time be different? Will policy and laws change after this shooting? Uh, you know, it, it is heartbreaking uh, and it does seem to be an epidemic, but I'm not sure that we're going to see any change. I mean, sadly, uh, we're at a loss of solutions. We're only about sides anymore. And I, I agree. Uh, I, I think that we have become completely desensitized to what's something that is absolutely outrageous that wouldn't be tolerated in any other nation on earth. I, I wonder how the rest of the world sees us as a, as a people, as a consequence of all of this. And, and what we've seen so far is every time there's been some big tragedy, some big mass shooting, it stays in the news cycle for a few days. You ha hear a lot of people talking about it. You might see some things in Congress trying to move through, but then after a few days, it just fizzled out. If you look at the Las Vegas massacre and everybody was talking about bump stocks and how there was this call to ban bump stocks and even the NRA was interested in banning bump stocks. It, and then all of a sudden it just, people lost interest and, and no one followed through with it and bump stocks are still legal here. And, and that's an easy one to address. Laura, this one, there's a slightly different feel. I, I point to the New York Post, conservative newspaper owned by Rupert Murdoch. Front page editorial, asking the president for common sense gun control. It's a complete 180 for that newspaper. Could it be because this is another school, not little kids, but they're high schoolers, a lot of them were freshmen. Could this be a little bit different than even Las Vegas or the Pulse nightclub? Well, you'd like to think so, but I, I tend to um, agree with the other panelists. I don't, I just don't think that it's at a tipping point. Um, I thought maybe Newtown would have been a, a tipping point oh or, God. I mean, think about that. Um, th this is, you know, random shootings have impacted members of Congress directly. Mm -hmm. The congressional baseball um, practice and Steve Scalise from Louisiana. Gabby Giffords is still suffering from serious uh, deficits because she was uh, attacked and members of her staff and the public were killed in Arizona. And so I just, you know, given what has already happened and then the, the carnage in, in, in Las Vegas was just horrifying. And I just, if none of those things have moved the needle. I, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing, Mike, that, you know, we have all kinds of solutions, sometimes for problems that, not, that, that don't exist. The wall, the, the Muslim travel ban and, and, and so forth. And we have something here that, can't, that, that action can be taken and action is not taken and the solutions are available. 100 countries, countries on earth have solutions to these problems and we cannot find them. Shannon, you, you served in the, reg in the legislature fairly recently. Why is that? Why is there no action on these things? And if there is action, it goes the other way in, in loosening gun restrictions. Look, I mean, I just think that the, that it's a failure to have a conversation about the root causes of some of these things. I mean, you know, people, reasonable people can disagree on gun policy, and I think it's a legitimate topic. We ought to be brave enough to talk about that. 
But the fact of the matter is, is we've got young kids here that are seeing so much trauma in their daily lives at very young ages. We shouldn't be surprised that we have th this kind of, of um, uh, violence. And, you know, look, I, I, it, it's horrible. We need to talk about it. But you know, my goodness, we need to focus on real issues. So banning real AR issues. 15s would not help? I don't know if it'll help or not. I believe in, in looking at the evidence and having a legitimate conversation. But I do know that when you have a 19 year old that uh, plans out this horrific, violent act, uh, that, that, you know, you know, yeah, the gun was the weapon of choice, but what causes a 19-year-old who clearly has had a history yeah. of, of uh, some really disturbing behavior, I mean, what, what causes a child to do that? And, and what are the adults, what are the adults doing to well, make sure was, children don't end up like that? The adults, I mean, he was orphaned. Yes. His, his father died when he was five, yes. and his and his mom just uh, passed away think, yeah. just not not very and long his, ago. And the friends where he was staying, apparently, according to their lawyer, they asked him to lock up the gun. Well, they allowed him to have it, but he had to keep it locked. But of course, he had the key. Go just ahead. because there are a variety of elements associated with this kind of a tragedy, mental health, um, uh, keeping a list of people who are likely to do something like this, the the red tag type of legislation, and the guns themselves. It doesn't mean that you can't address it. You know, That's only three or four elements that you need to look at. Legislation it looks like complex matters all the time. And whenever something like this comes out, it's hard to pinpoint exactly what can you do to prevent this from happening again. Not at all. And there's a lot of people who say what should be done first is to look at this as a public health crisis. Yes. And maybe if you do that, you look at the data, you collect as much statistics as possible, and really try to nail down how you can prevent something like or, this. Or, of course, the NRA has blocked even government from doing that. CDC can't look at gun violence. And we looked at how we saw how Rob Portman, according to OpenSecrets.org, has collected $3 million, $3.1 million over his career from the NRA. Are people going to start looking at those numbers, following that money to see who? is getting support from gun rights organizations. Well, it's interesting. Um, I think that if people are, maybe maybe this latest episode causes people to um, start paying more attention. If you don't like the, the gun policies that are, are being pursued by your elected leaders now, you have the vote. You, you have the ability to track the money, pay attention, read your, read your Dayton Daily News, listen to your public radio, um, and, and be informed, be informed voters. All right, let's get to our next topic. The only Democratic woman running for governor this week has dropped out a week after filing papers. Connie Pillich withdrew and announced her support for Richard Cordray. That leaves Republican Mary Taylor, the only woman running for the state's highest position. Laura Bischoff, she filed one week and withdrew the next. What was the reason? Um, well, I, I think she uh, probably, I haven't talked to Connie Pillich yeah. about this, but I, I, I would imagine she saw the writing on the wall and that she was um, out, out fundraised by Rich Cordray and um, maybe just not getting the traction she wanted. You know, what, what I think is interesting is that in, in Ohio's 215 years of history, we've never had uh, a woman elected to, uh, as governor or to the U.S. Senate. And uh, there's, um, I think, just in looking at the stats, there's typically only between 20 and 22 percent of the legislature is uh, held by women. Um, and uh, Senator Jones and I were talking about this before. It, it just, it's just a matter of um, you know, having, recruiting more women to run, having more choices for voters so that they don't have just the female choice that mm -hmm. they can pick from you know, three or four different women who are running. Would it have helped future women candidates, even if Connie Pillage could not have won this time around, to stay in the race longer, run a, a serious challenge, Janet? Would, would, it, would it help? I mean, Mary Taylor's still running. I don't know. I mean, know. you have to have the money to run yeah. a serious yeah. challenge. You get a million so, dollars, I mean. But, but if my 14-year-old daughter doesn't see your face on TV and doesn't see your campaign and doesn't see evidence of a woman running, what, what's the point? So, so you know, I, I, I think it was probably a smart move if she didn't have the financial resources to do it. And there was a bit of momentum behind uh, Cordray uh, as well. I think that he has managed the campaign thus far uh, well. Uh, I think that some interesting candidates still on there, but Mike, you're, you know, the comments about women staying in the race, I think are 
concerning, and I, I know that as a progressive, I would like to see uh, more women. It is a little baffling. I mean, last year, the original four candidates, we had Betty Sutton, Nan Whaley, and Connie yeah. Pillich, yeah. and then Joe Schiavone. So out of the four, there were three who were female, and now all of a sudden, there are no women running on the Democratic side. And not because they did anything that no. hurt their campaigns. Mm -hmm. It's just that, that cord rate got into yeah, the right. We should side. also point out that Mary Taylor is still in the race. Yeah. Uh, she's on the Republican um, side of things. She's leading, leading a ticket. But, you know, she didn't get the endorsement from, this, the, from the Ohio Republican Party State Central Committee, and she, is, um, she just doesn't have the money that Mike DeWine's campaign has. She, I mean, Connie Pillich had a great resume. Lawyer, MBA, Air Force veteran, former mm -hmm. state legislator. She's run statewide before. Why couldn't she catch fire? Why couldn't she make a bigger name, Joe? I, I just think that, that Cordray had been in the news uh, more consistently. Uh, uh, there are people that, uh, he's an uh, awfully smart uh, individual. He's won statewide hasn't before. Hasn't done one statewide before. Uh, has been in the national uh, uh, consciousness. Shannon, I get your perspective being from Southwest Ohio. Rand Paul endorsed Mike Gibbons, the Republican running against Jim Renacci for U.S. Senate. Is that aimed at Republicans in Southwest Ohio near the Kentucky border who might be more familiar with Rand Paul? What kind of impact might that, that have? Uh, none. none. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking too much. There. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't think so. Yeah. I think I think endorsements count very little. I think. Um, you know, they don't, it, you might like someone a lot, but what you think about them doesn't necessarily translate to someone else. I think voters are more perceptive than that, and they want to know what the actual candidate is about. You wonder if there's something going on with between Rand Paul and Jim Renacci in, in, in Washington. Well, and everything that happened with the budget deal, how Rand Paul was holding out because he didn't like what was going on, it's exactly what Mike Gibbons has been uh, campaigning about as well. So, I mean, I think it's a big get, get for him, but like Shannon said, I don't know how many voters will really appreciate the endorsement. The Republican Governors Association going to spend, what, 4.1 or 3 point something? They're going to spend a few million dollars on the governor's race here. Does that make a difference? Does it show that... Uh, what, is this, what does it mean? It means it's Ohio. That's what we do. Ohio well, is, a, yeah. is a very important state nationally. Uh, nationally, people look at it as a bellwether, and I can't even conceive of a time when big national organizations aren't going to participate in an open gubernatorial race. Amen. So the Democrats are likely <laughs> going to put in some money as well. I think more than likely. <laughs> right. And the world turns. Anyway, Ohio is supposed to have legal medical marijuana in early September, but meeting that legal deadline remains very much in doubt. This week, Cleveland.com found two issues with the process of awarding permits to grow medical pot. It found that two state employees had the ability to change application evaluator scores. There's no evidence that they did it, but it was possible. Then Cleveland.com reported that some of the applicants who got provisional licenses to grow medical pot did not meet the basic requirements under state law, but they promised to do so before final permitting. Joe Moss, you're the attorney. Yes. They must be salivating at this process if you're, if you're representing somebody who did not get a license. Well, I, I would rather, well, I would rather be representing somebody that got the license of course you would. somebody that's, <laughs> that's fighting yeah. uh, for their lives, but, uh, but you're right. And the process appears to include, and, and this has to do with rather obvious things, you know, whether they had enough money uh, up front, uh, they could get a bond. It had to do whether they were within what is it, 500, 500 feet of a feet school, of a or, school a or a playground, church or whatever. Church. And and uh, some of the applicants did not quite meet that. One of them, I think, missed it by 17 feet from a church. And uh, of course, the ones that didn't get the provisional license, 12 small growers, 12 large growers, the ones that didn't, then are appealing, are appealing for the, to yeah. the regulators. And then if they're unsuccessful, they can always uh, approach the common police court. And Laura, it turns out that another one should have been awarded sure, there was, an application. There's, um, there's been kind of a volley of letters yeah. going back and forth between the state auditor's office and the Department of Commerce. The most recent one was uh, on Thursday. The director of the department, Jacqueline Williams, uh, wrote to Dave Yost and said, look, um, we understand you have all these concerns and we're willing to put the program on pause until we've had a chance to iron all this out. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars here. Like people who wanted to grow pot here, I mean, it's a, it's a huge economy for them. And the fact that people could just go in and log in as these applicants and change the data is just, it's just crazy to me. Jen, is this growing pains, no pun intended, <laughs> incompetence or politics? Involved here. I don't know. I don't like to, to look at uh, motivations behind things that I don't know, but there's no doubt it's a really big business and 
you know, it, the, the fact that the state decided to go down this path, it means it's incumbent upon them to have all of the, you know, checks and balances in place, and clearly that, that's in question. And I, I do think it's growing pains. I don't think there's anything unusual going on behind the scenes. Mike, I'm not that uh, <laughs> cynical. But I, but I, t I want to remind everybody, I, I'd be remiss if I don't mention, let's not forget, all of this is illegal. Under federal. Uh, federal. federal. Yeah, right. Okay, that's uh, what I think is really interesting. So the state is taking a chance and the investors are taking, I think, a huge chance. The conspiracy theory is that this is intentional because the legislature really didn't want to do this in the first place, but they saw the polls and they said, mm -hmm. let's do it ourselves rather than have the voters do it. We can't no have any control. Is there any chance that this is deliberate sabotage? Is it I don't think it's uh, You know, look, I was a no. I was in the General Assembly at the time. I was a no. I think this is bad business. Okay. But, but, you know, as a practical matter, I don't think anybody's entered into this as a way to be Machiavellian. Okay. I think it was the path that they thought, that many thought they needed to take. Um, and so they've moved ahead. I, I just, you oh, know. Okay, so they're not sabotaging it. Might they be less enthusiastic about getting it going? That's what I, I mean. I think they could have done a better job. I mean, I have to jump through more hoops to sign. I'm selling my house right now. I have to jump through more hoops and, and I have to log on to one thing after another. I, you got to think that the state has a, a good process for making sure everything's secure. But I mean, well, keep in mind, they've never done this before. Yeah. This is, this yeah. is a brand new program. But they've had to do something like this. Not they've had to really. do something. No. I mean, really. there, <laughs> there are plenty of other states who have done this, and they seem right, to. Right, and they've been trying to model it after other states and picking, you know, picking the pieces that make the most sense, et cetera. Uh, you know, the way it was explained to me, uh, oh, that was a different problem. <laughs> well, there were <laughs> so many problems. But, with this. But we, you know, <laughs> Michigan was a problem. Michigan had no oversight. After they they launched the program, so they obviously are trying to. The state of Ohio is trying to. Uh, and other to states, Maryland has had a terrible time getting theirs up and going. It's 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 a hard thing to do, especially if it's illegal, right, Joe? <laughs> 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 All right, our next topic: Ohio House Republicans and John Kasich want to give the governor more control over education. This week, the House proposed merging the state's three departments focused on education into one agency. The new director would be appointed by the governor. Right now, the elected State Board of Education hires the person who oversees K-12 through education. Kasich says that makes no sense. You know when you go in and vote for judges, you have no idea who you're voting for? Let's be honest with ourselves here. We just don't know. We see these names. We go, what name sounds best? Now, maybe some of you study these things, but I don't always study them. Well, then we vote for the state school board. We have no clue who those people are, and they're running education policy, and I'm the governor, and I can't tell them what to do. Nuts. <laughs> Nuts. <laughs> well, how does he really feel? Anyway, Andy, how does, how does the governor and supporters of this move think that this will make education better in Ohio? Well, I think what they're saying is that this creates a clear line between the education system, education policy making, and to the governor. So when things need to be done, you can just kind of like get approval quicker or maybe speed things up. That's what they say, but I, I don't know how you make that happen when you're taking these three departments, then making a bigger umbrella organization. It feels like you're creating more and more bureaucracy to the system. I don't know how it just streamlines it all. And no additional money, by the way. Uh, so right. uh, You can see I, I how you might and, save some money if you have but, merging and efficiencies created in that merger. And by the way, Cordray is in favor of this. Oh, he's going to be, well, he could be you the know, next if, governor. If I were running for governor, I would want to have control, more control over it. I, that, that's completely legitimate. But, but you know, as a practical matter, you're going to spend a couple of years rearranging offices, and then w what does it translate to outcomes? You know, the, the real point here is, you know, what are we trying to get to? We're trying to train people to, for the jobs of today and tomorrow. And, and you know, in this state, we have 40, only 40% 40 of the kids who enter kindergarten ready to learn. So we can, we can align departments as much as we want, but until we really start to focus our education system earlier, uh, following the brain science, following the evidence, we're not gonna move the dial, no matter where your office is located. That comes out, I mean, Laura, the, the real power in, in education is at, at the parental level, at the most basic level, but it's local the school districts, superintendents, teachers, principals in, the, in your local schools, local school buildings. Right, and Ohio is very much a local control state when it comes to um, education policy and 
um, you know, who govern cities, et cetera. I think that um, this has been kind of like a, a thing that governors have wanted for a while. I think Voinovich wanted to, to do that. And they've, re, they've reworked the uh, state school board so that the governor has more appointees. But um, I guess the governor, governor Kasich doesn't think that that's enough and he wants to, to change this. Now, this is not going to impact him very much. Yeah. He's on his way out the door. So maybe this is his gift to the next governor. Well, does that, does that make it perhaps more politically possible in that it's not going to benefit the guy who's calling for it, that I'm doing this because it's the right thing to do for my predecessor, whatever party he or she is in? Well, I, I, I think Kasich, and in this case, maybe even Cord Ray, uh, would like to have more control. Mike DeWine or Mary Taylor. Mike, Taylor. whoever it might happen to Dennis be. Dennis Kucinich. So I think it's not <laughs> just... <laughs> or Dennis. <laughs> or Dennis, yeah. Larry Ely. Yep. Uh, how about switching control of education every four or eight years? Sherry, you kind of alluded to this. I mean, you have a state, a state school board now that nobody knows who they are, but they are elected. That sort of removes at least a, a, a layer of politics. That each governor is going to want to do their own thing to education. Yeah. Long term, is that hurt or help the state? Well, and, and let's and let's you know a lot of education policy is actually set by legislators, right? Yeah. So so things like the report card that I hear people complaining about ODE about, they're simply doing what the legislature mm -hmm. told them to do. So so the legislature is still going to exist. You know if if they're you know I hear about well there's issues with who we get who the person gets to hire and well you know you're not changing civil service. You know, so so it's really just a way to uh, rearrange the chairs, but doesn't get to the problem. And you know, look I, again, if I were governor, I'd want to have more control. There's certainly benefit to that, but there's a lot of moving pieces here, and and this is not going to improve outcomes. All right, our last topic: the state of Ohio wants people who get Medicaid to get a job. The Kasich administration plans to ask for permission to add a work requirement for adult Medicaid recipients. There would be some exceptions. Supporters say the requirement provides an incentive for people to get off public assistance. Critics point out that most Medicaid recipients are already working for companies that don't offer health insurance. Laura Bischoff, what, what is going on here? There was a study released just Friday. Only one in 20 recipients are going to be affected by this. Right. I think it's, um, you know, this is something that Republican state, that states governed by Republicans uh, have been moving toward Indiana, Kentucky. I think there's like maybe seven or eight other states that have asked for it. Um, and uh, I hear a lot of Republicans say, like, this is a matter of, of personal responsibility and, and providing kind of a ladder, like you're on Medicaid, but we want you to, to move off of it eventually. Um, you know, the tricky part is there's that, that study did say that the 60 percent of people are already working a couple of jobs. Yeah. They're low-paid jobs, and they, they don't have health benefits, yeah. and that's why they're on Medicaid. And they're not making um, enough to, they're, they're making a yeah. low wage enough to qualify for Medicaid. Sure, and now there's there's also, um, you know, there's so many exemptions in this, in the structure of what they're, what they're kind of contemplating. You know, anybody uh, over 55 would, would be excluded. Anybody who is in drug, re, drug or alcohol rehab, anybody who's in job training, anybody who's in school. Um, so, yeah, it kind of narrows down who would be impacted. I think this is kind of a feel-good thing for those who believe in the mythology that people who are receiving governmental help uh, of this type or of cash or whatever uh, somehow are lazy or not participating. But here's the interesting thing. 91% of the American people are in favor of uh, these kinds of provisions. Of requiring work. Yes. Is it welfare to work? It cuts across. We're a culture yeah. that values work. I mean, we, you know, I, I try to teach my own children about the value of work and, har and hard work. And so, you know, it's a statement of our values as much as anything. So th there's nothing wrong with that to the extent that people can work and aren't working and there isn't some alternative like yeah. school, then we should, we, we can be for, for that and then, you know, move on. And let's focus on some of the real challenges with some of these poor working families. Like, you know, I can go to work if I'm poor uh, without health care, but I can't go to work without quality child care for yes. my two children. And a lot of families are being led by single parents in this uh, state, particularly women, and uh, child care is not affordable. So those are the sorts of issues that we need to get to. So if there's a work requirement, let's, let's establish that as a value. All right, let's get to our off the record 
final parting shots. And Joe Moss, you're up first. Yeah, Mike, at this point, nobody's going to be very surprised that I'm going to predict that any kind of immigration uh, agenda is not going to pass uh, Congress. As a matter of fact, uh, the only surviving measure is in the House. The Senate has uh, failed, and the president's position to have dramatic changes to legal immigration programs must be part of any deal that guarantees defeat. Jen. Uh, we spent some time today talking about uh, the women running for governor who are no longer running. Um, I would say my prediction is this idea that we have yet another year of the woman that we've heard about for decades uh, isn't going to materialize. Okay. Andy. Going back to this education overhaul plan that the House is introducing, I think this is going to be the big story for a few months or maybe the whole year. Now that redistricting is, has passed and is, is going to the voters, I think this education overhaul is going to be the big thing in the State House. And Laura? I think uh, kind of reiterating what we were talking about with gun violence, I don't think that um, we're at a tipping point just yet. I think the tipping point would come uh, when voters are more engaged, as they are on the right. A lot of them vote based on kind of using guns as a, as a litmus test, and I think that um, other people need to be as engaged. All right. My prediction is September 8th. September 8th is the day that Ohioans are supposed to be able to take a prescription into a dispensary and get medical marijuana. It's in state law, but I predict that they won't make it. <laughs> maybe, maybe October 8th, November 8th, 2019. Anyway, that is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online, Facebook and Twitter. You can continue the discussion there and also catch each episode online on demand at our website, WOSU dot org slash C-O-T-R. For our crew and for our panel, I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.